Over the past few months, the Square Enix marketing machine has been in overdrive. Ever since mid-September, when Final Fantasy VII Rebirth appeared during the State of Play broadcast, it's been near non-stop coverage. Not long after, video games journalists and content creators from around the world were given hands-on time with the second part of the Final Fantasy VII Remake project, and attendees at the Tokyo Game Show were also treated to the same two-part demo. At the same event, Square Enix also hosted an extensive hour-long live broadcast with Naoki Hamaguchi, Tetsuya Nomura, and Yoshinori Kitaze. The trio detailed how the open-world environment will work, reintroduced some old characters, and also showed off some mini-games. Since then, there have been numerous interviews conducted with the developers. The developers have also written blog posts, published via PlayStation and Square Enix's own official channels, and there have also been plenty of interim pieces of multimedia, such as the Story So Far recap video. Needless to say, it's been a lot. But with there's still so much to show, and not much time left until launch to show it, Square Enix stunned audiences again by revealing a brand new trailer during the Game Awards, no doubt because it's the last major event of the year where gaming eyes from all over the world are fixed on a single target. The trailer clocked in at just 2 minutes and 36 seconds, and there was so much shown, including the long-awaited reveal of Sid Highwind. But with so much to explore, and having now watched the trailer countless times to sift through everything with a fine tooth comb, we're excited to take you through some of the more subtle details. So with that in mind, sit back and relax as we take you through some of the things you may have missed from the recent Final Fantasy VII Rebirth trailer that just dropped during the Game Awards. And what better place to start than with the legendary date sequence. There has been much debate online about how the gold source of date sequence will be handled, and we now have confirmation via the trailer itself and supporting material that it will be handled in much the same manner as the original game. The trailer itself showed part of this sequence, with Aerith and Cloud enjoying their ride on the round square, but we also know that it will be possible for Cloud to go on dates with Tifa, Yuffie, and yes, even Barrett, and they will do so on what's been renamed as the Sky Wheel. Much like the original game, who Cloud takes on the date will be handled by a hidden mechanic, as the story develops, Cloud will be given the choice to respond to each character in different ways, and each positive or negative answer will increase or decrease points. The character with the highest points, when the date sequence happens, will then be taken on the date. It's unclear how easy this will be to sway, but with there being four separate options, it does seem as though Square Enix may be encouraging replayability, much like they did with the Chapter 14 sequence that appeared in Remake. In the original game, if Aerith, Tifa or Yuffie were taken on the date, then Cloud would also visit the event square to take part in a play which has now been officially named as a rendition of Loveless. This sequence will still happen, but it now seems to be an all-inclusive sequence as every member of the party, even Kate Sith, was shown to be in full costume. According to a supporting blog post, the hidden relationship mechanic will then be used to determine who fulfills which role within the script of the play. Perhaps the more curious element around this, outside of Aerith belting out the new theme tune, which is called No Promises to Keep, is that Jessie seems to be part of the broadcast too. We don't quite understand the context behind this, but the notion of Jessie still being alive has been circled for some time, and Square Enix themselves have been coy whenever this subject has been brought up. As we have been seeing throughout much of the promotion for Rebirth, Zack was front and centre. The now infamous sequence started off the trailer and it had an ominous tone, and this was then followed up with numerous other ominous sequences. We now know, for example, that within this alternate continuity, that Biggs is indeed alive and well, and that the other members of Avalanche are presumed to have been dealt with. During the Summer Game Fest trailer, we saw many of the playable party being carried off on stretchers by members of the Shinra Public Security Forces. But now, we can see that Aerith is in a comatose state at the residence of Elmira Gainsborough, and this is where Zack will take Cloud. While there, Zack will have the chance to interact with Marlene Wallace, who we know from Remake has some kind of special cognition. It's also very intriguing that she seems to be alive and well in both timelines. Now much has been said in the build up to Rebirth about how expansive the world will now be in comparison to Remake, and the trailer showed off a large array of locations. There were clips from what can be assumed to be the Cave of the Gi, where Red 13 will hopefully learn the truth about his father again and come of age. 
Com, which we now know will be an expansive hub of sorts, and there will be much more importance placed here than there was in the original game. Junin, where we know Cloud will have to dress up as a Shinra infantryman, and as a way of highlighting how far this will go, we can even see members of the 7th Division appearing as temporary party members. The Coral Prison, where an entire ecosystem now lives and breathes. And of course, the Gold Saucer, which will have many of its seven squares accessible, including the Ghost Square. Through these locations, we will gain the chance to interact with numerous NPCs, some of which existed in the original game, and some of which are brand new for Rebirth. The major addition featured in the trailer was a character called Solemn Gus, who will serve as a kingpin of the Coral Prison, and he was given some screen time alongside Bugenhagen, Dio, and Dying. Each of the returning characters sported faithful but embellished designs, and it seems as though with Bugenhagen they have opted for a more subtle floating orb to assist with his travel than was seen in Before Crisis. Perhaps the more interesting recreation here though is Dine. His colour palette is now much more muted, with the purple hair and vibrant green trousers now toned down. And although the gun arm does look very similar, a change has been made to how the ammunition clip is stored. Instead of there being one big cylindrical magazine on the bottom of the gun, it now appears to be two smaller cylinders. But if we're talking about Bugenhagen, Dio and Dine, it would be remiss not to talk about Sid Highwind. Sid only appeared for two brief moments in the trailer, one of which showed off the famed Tiny Bronco. But when combined with what's been revealed via supporting material, those brief moments are more than enough for a small breakdown. The design of Sid is almost identical to the original design, with even the high wind patch being brought forward into the modern era and the pure white neck scarf. That's not to say there aren't some subtle differences, however. Colours are a close match, but they have been dulled compared to the original, and the body proportions are now a bit more realistic, which has led to the jacket being made longer. Perhaps the biggest change, however, is the removal of Sid's pack of cigarettes from his goggles. These were front and centre in the original game, but have now been removed, perhaps due to modern sensibilities. That then brings us on to the summons. We already knew that they would be introducing quite a few summons for Rebirth, with Odin, Alexander and Kujata already revealed. But this new trailer showed off Titan, Phoenix and a brand new summon called Bahamut Arisen. Titan will retain quite a few design traits from the original game, including the gold bracelets and jade coloured necklace and waist belt. But Titan's skin has undergone a huge change. For many years, Titan was positioned as just being a gigantic human. And this was the case in the original Final Fantasy VII, as well as many other iterations around that time. But in more recent years, starting with the original iteration of Final Fantasy XIV, this has been changed. Now, Titan is more often seen with rock plating, and other iterations to feature a similar aesthetic since Final Fantasy XIV have been Titan in World of Final Fantasy, and more recently, in Final Fantasy XVI. Phoenix has also seen some intriguing design changes. Final Fantasy VII was the first iteration in the franchise to introduce the notion of rainbow colouring, a trend that was carried forward with Final Fantasy VIII, IX, XII, and Crisis Core. This iteration still has the notion of colour gradient, but the greens and blues are no longer present, with more focus placed around a gradient from orange through to pink. The other notable change is that Phoenix now has clear armour plating. This has almost never been seen before with any iteration of the Phoenix, the only major exception being concept art from Type-0, but Phoenix did not appear in the final product. Bahamut Arisen is the new kid on the block, but that should hardly come as a surprise. Over the years, the compilation of Final Fantasy VII has been a breeding ground for Bahamut, and the inclusion of Arisen now means there have been six different iterations if we're not counting the remake iteration as original. Bahamut Arisen pulls from many different places to create something original. Its head tail, for example, is quite unique, but this design element has been seen before in Revenant Wings of all places. In terms of everything else, well, we saw two brand new synergy attacks, one called Firework Blade, which can be performed by Cloud and Aerith, and the other called Moogle Donk Shot, which can be performed by Tifa and Kate Sith. Vincent was also given more time in the spotlight, and a full render was revealed. As part of this, we got to see an updated design for the Quicksilver, Vincent's starting pistol. It also appears as though Cloud can take part in some fun in either Junon or aboard a luxury ship, perhaps as a way of travelling between Junon and Costa del Sol after the initial story sequence has been completed. And was that Madame M at the Gold Saucer? Oh, 
There's also the foreboding and rather teasing conclusion of the trailer, but it feels like that's best left for another discussion at a future date. But with that, we hoped you enjoyed this breakdown. Be sure to let us know in the comments what your favourite part of the trailer was and if there was anything crucial you felt we missed. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to give us a like and subscribe for more content. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more final fantasy goodness.